Hi everybody, it's Ben Thompson here and welcome to the Import Export Podcast. Today we're talking about collapsible shipping containers. We all know that the 20 foot and 40 foot shipping containers have changed the way the global trade and products have been shipped all around the world. Since the beginning of the shipping container in the late 50s, it has absolutely changed the way goods are traded. Today we're joined by Nicholas from CEC Systems to discuss his collapsible shipping container design and how it fits into the market. Nick, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Appreciate being here. Yeah, so uh, before we get started, Nicholas, um, tell me a bit about the experience you've had in logistics and how you actually came to developing a collapsible shipping container. Sure. Uh, so, look, I started my career as a young 18-year-old joining the Australian Army. Um, after 18 months at Duntroon, I graduated and was uh, actually placed into the Royal Australian Corps of Transport. Um, now, I ended up specialising in more of the international uh, strategic multimodal type logistics, uh, where we looked at you know planning and uh, of how we deploy and redeploy battle groups. Yep. Um, but that was actually sort of where this whole thing came from. Um, in 2008, I was uh, deployed to uh, Kuwait and then to Afghanistan. Uh, in that specific sort of strategic logistics role. And one of the things that we noticed was um, the amount of equipment coming into Afghanistan to support all the troops in country. Um, now, the reality was that uh, everything had to come in via either air, which was really expensive, or it came in via shipping containers from Karachi up in up through the, you know, the, the mountains into Afghanistan. Um, what, what the issue we noted was, was... Um, all these troops in country, and we had, you know, I think at the, at the time there was about 100,000 troops in country, so quite a significant amount of troops. Um, with, with that many troops comes a lot of equipment. And so the containers would come in, but then they would be dis, uh, uh, unloaded in, in Kandahar or, or various other places. And then that equipment would then filter out to the wider, you know, operations. But the container itself, because the cost to bring the container up from Karachi into Afghanistan was $12,000 US per box. Mm. Uh, basically, it was structured that the, the cost to return them was far greater than the actual value of the box. Yeah. So they all ended up just sitting there uh, because it was cheaper to leave them there and write them off. Um, and so, you know, the, the companies that had these contracts were smart. They would go around their fleets and dig up the old, you know, boxes that were on their last legs and they knew that they would not be coming back and then they'd charge defense for a whole new one. Yeah. Um, but it was, it was just a purely economic um, question of whether these boxes would be returning. So seeing these boxes piling up, and we had, at one point, we had something like 15,000 boxes at one of the bases. Mm. And there's only so much you can do with those boxes. You can convert them into, you know, workshops and things like that, but, yeah. uh, or bunkers or whatever. But, uh, you know, you get through 500 and you're still sitting there going, well, there's another 14,000 to go. <laughs> um, <laughs> so to me, I started looking at it and said, hang on, if, if this is a problem in a military context, what is the problem in a civilian context? Um, because I, I like to look at history and I like to see, okay, well, a lot of great technology has come from, uh, from, from the military. I mean, the first, it's, the first box itself, the 20 foot box, really, you know, it, was, it was, came into its own during the Vietnam War. Mm. Um, but, you know, I like to look at the military example and say, okay, if there's technology here from a military perspective, what is the commercial or the civilian um, implications of this? And it was, it was from there that I started researching and understanding, okay, well, this is a global problem. Um, this is a, a $30 billion a year loss problem. Um, so there's got to be a solution in which you can necessarily remove the problem because it's an imbalanced problem, but maybe you can reduce the impact. And that's why I started thinking about, okay, what about an idea of a box that collapses? It's, it's happened with pallets. It happens with storage companies. It's happened with all kinds of things. Yeah. Why shouldn't or couldn't a container collapse? Mm -hmm. So that's sort of the, the, the genesis of, of where this came from, and for, for me at least, where this came from and, and how it was influenced by an operational setting. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's very interesting. It's, um, yeah, obviously a massive problem with your military background. And, um, yeah, it's, it's a, obviously a problem as well in, um, in civilian life or commercial life, commercial shipping. Um, when you looked into the market, when, when you're talking about commercial shipping, um, can you give me some examples of what, what types or what routes or what scenarios that um, straight away a collapsible shipping container would be a lot better solution? Sure, sure. So, I mean, I openly say that uh, a collapsible solution is not meant to replace every container in the world. 
Yeah. Um, there are, you know, th there's a lot of countries, a lot of trade routes where one container in, one container out, they work the load. You know, particularly let's say um, in a European context where trade is moving all around Europe via rail and, you know, you can load a container and unload it at one end and then there's enough cargo to load it back up and you can ship through it. Yeah. Where, where collapsibles come in is, is traditionally around major trade and balance routes. Um, so if we look at the, the big shipping lines um, and say a country to country route, China to Australia, for example, um, we know that Australia, we don't export that much consumable goods or product good. We export a lot of fruit and vegetable uh, and we export a lot of natural mineral, uh, minerals and resources, you know, iron ore, coal, all that sort of stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. But we don't, we don't build consumer based products like TVs and things like that. Yeah. Um, but say China, for example, they import a lot of our coal and that side of things, but they export a lot of consumer based products, clothing, electronics, all that sort of thing. Yeah. So you can already see that on a route like this, there is a major imbalance between what is imported and what is exported. Mm -hmm. And therefore the use of a container on that route is still very valid, but it results in a, in a basically a stockpiling of empties at one end. Mm -hmm. So on that Australia, China route, because of the trade imbalance, because of the imbalance in, in what we import and export on both ends, basically for every hundred odd containers that come into Australia, our export capacity is only 35 containers. Mm. So that means out of every hundred, you have 65 accumulating in Australia that eventually have to be shipped back up north for reselling because they incur their own costs being empty sitting in Australia. Yes. And they also represent an asset on the owner's books. You know, it's an asset that they want to be able to reuse. That's right. Um, the, the, the problem is magnified when you go to um, smaller countries and regional shipping lines and routes. Okay. So if we looked at, say, um, Australia to the Pacific Islands, uh, we export food and things like that to the Pacific Islands. Um, the, the imbalance is, is almost for every 100 containers that we export, our import is only one back. So okay. basically 99 containers come back to us empty or go on somewhere else empty yeah. uh, because those countries don't produce enough export to fill those containers. Yeah. Um, the, the same problem is, is, is replicated when you look at regional um, routes. So places like Indonesia and Philippines, where you, your domestic supply is actually through regional shipping lines because you're an island-based nation. Uh, mm -hmm. Australia is lucky you have rail, so you can put everything on rail and rail it around the country. But let's say Indonesia or, or Philippines, they are island countries. So things have to move through coastal shipping, through regional coastal shipping. Yeah. That same problem exists, but at a regional level, because you have parts of the country that will consume and parts of the country that will produce. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's these sort of routes where the empty container forms the biggest problem. And it's these sort of routes where the collapsible container actually, again, can't solve the problem, but can dramatically reduce the loss associated with the storage, handling and redistribution of those containers on those routes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, absolutely. Every, every everybody's losing money when um, containers are being moved around empty. And as, as you say, if it's such a trade imbalance in that example, one, one container returning uh, full as to 100 that have been sent there, um, that's obviously costing a lot of money. So um, yeah, that's, that's great. I mean, and along other modes of the supply chains, th those are examples within C, I assume that, um, these problems will exist uh, the same along rail and um, road transport potentially as well. Um, w where will it be adopted in, in it, which area the most? Uh, will it be only sea freight or be a mixture of, of lots of those modes? Or what, what do you think it's, is going to happen there? Look, I think um, it, it's it both um, class and mode dependent on where it's going to be most effective across the industry as a wider, as a wider industry. Yeah. Um, why I say that is uh, when we look at the three main you know, users slash owners of containers across the supply chain, you have the sea, you have the rail, and you have the road. Yeah. Um, the, the breakup is essentially the, the container, the, the, the major shipping lines and the container leases will own the majority of the container fleet. Uh, but then you will have three PLs who own a percentage of, of, of you know, containers. Um, you know, so you may have, say, a, a domestic 3PL operator who may have 40,000 containers versus a mask who may have 3.2 million containers, mm. but they do have a fleet. Um, why I say it, it's a different asset class it depends on which one you're talking to. So if you're talking to a major shipping line, 60% um, of their fleet at a minimum is 40 footers and then about 18% is 20 footers and then the rest are 
reefers and all kinds of other bits and pieces, say 45 footers for domestic uh, US operations, and things like that. So they have a, a bit of a mix, but yeah. 40 footers make up their main target. When you look at say then the regional shipping lines, um, who particularly focus on coastal domestic shipping, they'll prefer 20 footers because 20 footers for them are easier to move domestically when they go then to the next mode being the road, because obviously the 20 footers are easy to maneuver around a city versus the 40 foot. Yeah. Um, so they have a different um, requirement based on the, the, the mode of transport they're traveling on. Then to add to that, there's also the route side to this, which is when you look at say um, the shipping lines, they'll want the, the 40 footers on the major routes. Uh, when you look at the coastal shipping lines, they'll want the 20 footers on, on the domestic slash coastal routes. Uh, yeah. But when you look at the three PLs, they'll want the 20 footers for the road, but then they'll want the 40 footers for the rail. So Sydney to Perth is a really good example. Um, because the cost is prohibitive to send a ship from Sydney and Melbourne all the way around to Perth before going back up into Asia, um, most of the time, not all, but most of the time, uh, cargo destined for Perth in Western Australia ends up being offloaded in Sydney and Melbourne and then railed across to Perth because it's actually cheaper to do that. Um, those containers, when they get to Perth, again, Perth is a commodity-based export, not a product-based export. So those containers end up going back to Sydney or Melbourne via rail empty. Mm. They want 40-footers because a 40-footer is, is double the capacity with half the handling of a 20, basically. Mm. Um, well, it's the same handling as a 20, I should say. It's just obviously 20 is 20. And, um, so, as I said, the, the, the use or the, the, the selection to use collapsible containers is very much dependent on the mode that you're using and the, the route that you're using. But as I said at the start, it, it's definitely not designed to replace all containers. It's designed for imbalanced routes where the, the imbalance is significant and will only grow over time with, as trade grows. Mm. Yeah, no, there's, there sounds like there's definitely a, a lot of opportunity there that's just being wasted. There's plenty of um, examples in the market where it can be used and that it should bring um, a lot of cost savings um, in, in many different areas around the world. So I think it's only a great thing. Um, so t tell me a bit about uh, the design of your shipping containers. I mean, uh, in the past, there's been um, a few designs of collapsible shipping containers and it never seemed to become a mainstream product um what what do you think what's the flaws of some of the previous designs and what do you what is your team doing to ensure that your collapsible shipping container is quite strong and and will be reliable yeah absolutely um look absolutely right there have been uh, other attempts at collapsible shipping uh, containers in the past um going back at least 25 if not 30 years um what we did when we looked at this as i said at the beginning you know, this was driven around an operational requirement. So I, I'm not an engineer by trade, I'm a logistician. Um, so when I looked at the product, I looked at it from an operational perspective, not an engineering perspective. I worked through a product spec and said, this is what, from an operational point of view, it has to achieve. Yeah. And then we could figure out the engineering of how we make that happen versus yeah. what is an engineered solution that works perfectly regardless of the operational environment it's operating. And that has been one of the big issues. The big issues have been that... Um, uh, essentially, it's got to do with uh, operational cost and safety. They've been the three big barriers to, to collapsibles in the past. Um, almost all the collapsibles that have, have been developed have essentially been somewhat flat pack type design, essentially a container that collapses to a, a third or a fourth of its height, and then you just stack them one, two, three, and four as a flat pack. Yeah. Um, I looked at that and said, well, there's a natural limitation from an operational point of view of their capacity to sustain weight on top of their unit. Yeah. So what we looked at in our design was we started off with the idea that every container has to have a big end frame at each end that can sustain weight. And what we did in our one was essentially created a container that could be treated like a standard unit, whether it's in a single state or a combined state. And so these big end frames that we've developed can actually take 382 ton on top of them which means yeah. if you've got a stack of 10 fully laden containers, mm. you can put that at the bottom of the vessel or the bottom of the stack at the port and you mm. can treat it like a normal container. You're not having to add operational process and thinking yeah. to how you handle this container from a day-to-day -day planning point of view. So that's yeah. one part. Um, another part has been around from an operational point of view, um, being collapsible brings a requirement to actually collapse or, or, or expand the container. That takes time and that's a service that costs money. So that's been a natural limitation. What we said was 
One of the reasons why that's a natural limitation is the time it takes and the delay in basically, you know, port or empty container park operations in having to collapse these things mm -hmm. because the handling was excessive where you would need a crane or a forklift or whatever to, to actually be involved in the collapsing. And then once it was collapsed and let's say it's a quarter of its height has to then be stacked and then stacked and then stacked. And mm -hmm. then they'd have to be moved as, a, as you know, separate units still. So yeah, okay, you saved in storage, but you didn't necessarily save in handling. If anything, you actually increased your handling requirement. Mm -hmm. So we said, no, we, we've got to address that straight on. And we designed a platform that goes with our container that allows you to collapse the container in about two minutes or less. I mean, our best time we ever did, it was 55 seconds to collapse the container. Yeah. Um, but essentially it meant that the platform enabled a forklift to drive the container, dump it on the platform, drive away and get the next one. Yeah. Whilst the operators were then collapsing it in two minutes or less, you could then simply bring the next container and place it right next to it. And then once you've done that with the four containers and they end up forming like a toaster, um, essentially the end frames we mentioned form the method of interlock. So that, that resolved a number of things around how much handling intensity was involved for collapsibles. Again, that was one of the big issues of why they haven't been that widely uptake uh, across the industry. Mm -hmm. um, the, the other side has got to do with, with the safety, which has always been around the operators getting in and out of these containers collapsing. Now, personally, I don't like the idea of, of you know, getting into a 40 foot bit of steel that's collapsing. Mm. Um, but, you know, we've addressed that by having a complete stand back system where you can stand back and press a button and essentially it collapses. Um, and then finally, the cost. The, the, the biggest issue, like anything, is always the cost of the system. Um, yeah, it, it, look, I'll, I'll be honest and say our systems are more expensive than a standard box. Of course they're going to be. They're, they're more complicated than manufacturing. They use more steel. Mm -hmm. uh, but the reality is that um, the cost issue has always been associated with the fact that there has never been a significant mass quantity of collapsibles in the market to be able to get economy of scale in production. Um, we have been very, very, um, very specific about how we manufacture the container to utilize common industry standard material, common industry standard manufacturing processes, common industry um, standard manufacturing in general. And that has enabled us to get the cost down to still a higher point of a normal container, but a more reasonable point uh, of sale, sorry, a point of, of, of acquisition um, upfront based on the return of investment it's gonna generate over the life. Um, so, so these are traditionally the issues that are being presented and these are traditionally uh, sorry, these are the issues that we have worked to overcome with our design. As I said about the design, it's essential. We looked at it and said, it's got to stay up. It's not a flat pack. It's actually a width collapse. Yeah. Okay. Well, that sounds great, Nicholas. Um, you've obviously put a lot of time and effort into understanding what the problems were with collapsible shipping containers in the past and, um, you know, made sure that you've overcome those. Uh, like you said, the the strength straight away is, is the biggest issue. These containers have got to be able to be stacked and moved around and, and be able to be placed anywhere in a stack at a port or a rail railhead or whatever. Um, so, um, yeah, and they've got to be handled the right way. They've got to be easily um, taken apart and put back together. And it sounds like you guys have really sort of uh, come up with a really unique solution here. Um, and I hope it, hope it sort of takes off well for you guys. Oh, thank you. Yeah. I mean, look, that, that's the reality, as I said earlier in the interview, is, is this system has really been, the design has been driven by both an understanding of what's come before and an operational perspective. Yeah. And it's amazing when we, we go and see many of the shipping lines, um, many times they'll take a meeting out of respect and say, okay, look, you know, we will we'll, we'll meet with you. Um, and we, we generally get the same response at the beginning of each meeting, which is, Oh yeah, collapsibles. We've seen this before. Yeah, yeah, all right. And it's amazing to watch their their face, their attitude, their their whole demeanor change uh, yeah. when we show them the system because their perception uh, of what they think we're going to present versus what we have developed is is vastly different. Um, you know, they 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 often think it's a flat pack. They often think, oh yeah, the the biggest issue is strength, as we just said then. Um, you know, we, we spent so much time understanding the specification, understanding the history, and then building the specification based on the operational requirement um, that we are getting very different responses. I mean, the fact that we collapse, collapse from a width perspective instead of a height perspective 
automatically in many minds changes their perception. The fact that, for example, um, we have a steel floor and that enables us to load the container with all the weight like normal container with the forklifts driving in and out and all that side of thing. Yeah. Again, the, the sort of design from an operational perspective has meant that the, the industry looks at us and says, this is actually something very different that we haven't seen before. We're willing to talk further about this, which yeah. is, a, you know, it, it's a great, great sort of feedback to receive. Yeah, absolutely. And um, and so, what stage uh, are you at within the market? Have you you've you've um, built these um, units? So, have you got them out there during doing trials, or when when will you be able to uh, do these in mass production? So, so essentially, we are already set up for mass production. Um, mm -hmm. We we spent the last couple of years building so the product itself. Collapsicon is the product. Uh, but we had originally developed what we called the C400, the cargo 40-foot version zero. It was built as a proof of concept system because obviously this is a radically new design uh, that still had to achieve all the things of, you know, be treated like a normal container, look like a normal container, but yet collapse to a quarter of its width and then combine together yeah. uh, with no external parts. So these were some key um, things that we had to solve through the proof of concept. Yeah. When we did that, we actually over-engineered the system, and we did that intentionally. You know, it was very heavy. Um, it had a lot of extra steel that it didn't need to do because we, we designed it not only to the CSC standard, but to the ISO standard and the American Railroad standard and a whole bunch of different standards. So as a result of that, it was very over-engineered. Um, through our support from the Australian government and the Singapore government, um, we have essentially spent the last year and a half optimizing the system dramatically. So that looked at how do we produce it cheaper? How do we use less steel? How do we increase the load capacity? How do we make it even more operationally functional? So all these sort of things. And that has resulted in the development of the C401. And the 401 is actually the um, commercial version of the system. Yeah. So that product uh, is actually now ready. And that product will start trials with a number of shipping lines and 3PLs throughout the year. Basically, um, as a business, the way we operate is we have a small trial fleet of containers that we own. And we provide them to customers for a period of two, three, four months, depending on you know, what the nature of the trial is, whether it's road or city or rail or whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. uh, and then from there, we work with those customers to actually show the benefits of the system in their supply chain. Um, as I said, it's, it's meant for you know, specific routes, not all routes. So um, that product will actually be out with customers throughout all of 2019. Uh, and then from there, basically how we operate is that we don't hold actually a fleet. Uh, we don't build a fleet and then hold them ready as inventory to sell. We actually build to order. So from there, once, once customers are happy, then they can choose to either buy containers or lease containers or, or however they want to engage. Um, but uh, the 401 is, is now available for market, um, mm -hmm. as well as a tracking system that we have to make sure that you know, the users can get the best optimization of where are my containers at any one time, so how can I plan for my quarter one or, you know. Um, and then later in the year through customer demand, we've actually um, accelerating the development of our 20-footer, uh, and that should hopefully be ready for, for market release by the end of the year as well. We've had quite a few customers say, look, we love the 40, we want to engage with the 40, but we yeah. also want the 20. So yeah. when can you get that to us as well? So <laughs> that sort of accelerated our, our timeline quite a lot, which is, which is a great problem to have. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, so the 401 is, is, is available uh, for trials from this year, as in it's already going out to trials this year with customers. Absolutely, that sounds great. And how can um, interested potential customers get in touch with you? What's the best way to get in touch about um, new sales inquiries? I would say head over to our website, www.cecsystems.co, uh, and there's an obviously an inquiry element that they can they can leave their interest in, yeah. uh, and, uh, and and then we will happily contact them. Yeah, all right. Well, um, okay. Well, yeah, that's great. Thanks, Nicholas, for giving us um, an insight into your collapsible container. Um, yeah, it, it's very interesting how in how many use cases. Um, this this type of container can be applied to straight away. Um, it's, I'm I'm excited to see um, how how far it penetrates into the market and how long it takes to get uh, you know sort of a, a mass sort of mass reach. Um, I think uh, yeah I think it's not not too far off. The world's the world of shipping is changing and um, yeah I think it's going to happen quicker than we think. So um, yeah. Yeah. Hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> So thanks very much, Nicholas, for your time, um, and we'll leave it at that. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it.